All right, guys, good evening and welcome to your 2022 ASA uh, ref training. Uh, you have Frankie on the line as well as uh, Evan Nylander here uh, hosting. Couple rules of the road. Uh, for our Zoom meeting details, please go into the chat feed on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, just type your name. That'll be how we're taking attendance for tonight. Uh, for the chat forum, if you're seeing uh, you have a question as we go through, we'll try to periodically stop, but go ahead and type in any sort of questions you may have during uh, this course. We'll try to stop answering those questions as we're going. Um, resources and all the content from this meeting will be shared. Um, probably this evening, if not tomorrow morning, we'll send uh, this video and kind of the PDF of the presentation out to uh, the balance of the group. If you've not already done so, I believe everybody here has already gone into the, uh, the Google file, uh, the form, put out your information, uh, recognize that we will be sending that. We took that information to create what the staffing will look like, and we went ahead and sent that out. Um, you guys will see the referee schedule either today or tomorrow. Uh, we took all that input from your Google Forms. If for whatever reason, any of the dates uh, that you thought you were available. I know you guys filled it out three, four weeks ago. If you find that any of that information is incorrect, uh, please, please, please take a really close look at that uh, once that comes out the next day or so. Confirm that you can work all the days that you have been assigned. Uh, we try to do a pretty good job of, of keeping you in kind of your home area where at all possible. Every now and then you do have to travel uh, just a little bit. But uh, keep an eye on that and give Frankie and I any feedback if there's any dates that are mismatched. If Guys, you know, wanna, go ahead. Evan, I'm going to bump in real quick. Guys, in, in putting this schedule together, which Evan done a great job with, um, one date that we notice is kind of a, uh, a thin date for us is May 9th. So, I'm sorry, June 9th, uh, which is a Thursday. Um, so if you put in that you were unavailable on that date and you're now available or you can find somewhere to make yourself, uh, you know, available for that evening, let us know. Um, we're pretty much covered. We don't have a lot of, uh, spares for that date. Well, we like to always have a spare body or two just in case, you know, we have to make uh, changes along the line. Um, so again, if that date looks like it is now an available date for you, additionally, uh, May 31st. Uh, which is our first week, same thing. We're, we're you know, we're covered, not a whole lot of uh, reserve in there. So those dates in particular, um, you've got some availability, didn't originally have when you've uh, indicated your availability uh, in that Google Doc. Uh, if that's changed, let us know. I'll turn it back over to you. Good, good, good point. Uh, other thing, refs, uh, since you're in the virtual training, you guys on your Google form either said, I want to pick my shirt up, uh, at Frankie's house, if you're in town in Buckhead or at my house, uh, if you're in Dunwoody or OTP, uh, if you haven't already, please make a point to come pick those up in the next week and a half. So you've got a uh, new white shirt here before uh, the meet start. Uh, when you do get that last piece of information about where your meets are, please don't swap meets unless you reach out to Frankie and say, hey, here's the deal. Um, I need to change because of where my work is or some time aspect. Let us work through those. There's oftentimes we are slotting people for specific meets for specific reasons. So uh, please don't make those changes unless uh, you get confirmation from, uh, from Frank or myself. Why are we here? The whole point of being a referee is to be an impartial third party to make sure that everybody gets a fair swim and gets the meet completed in a very, um, uh, fast as possible, but efficient as possible uh, uh, aspect. We want to help introduce kids to swimming in a fun, safe, and secure environment. We, are, we always say we're not here to make the next Olympian. Sometimes Olympians come out of our program, but we are that grassroots opportunity to introduce kids to the sport. It's a life skill, but it is also very much about having fun and we play a pivotal role in ensuring that these kids have fun in a safe and efficient manner. If you embrace the concept that it's summer league and it's supposed to be about fun, uh, you'll be pretty darn successful. And a lot of these kids will, will ultimately stay in the sport of swimming. Fun, however, does not mean chaos. It doesn't mean do whatever you want. Um, you do have to set the ground rules, follow the rules that we're gonna go through today. And for the most part, you'll be pretty successful. 
Um, Summer League is not USA Swimming. People who want to be in USA Swimming will navigate to USA Swimming in addition to Summer League Swimming. There are fundamental differences between ASA rules and USA Swimming rules, so please pay attention to those and, uh, and adopt those. And lastly, you want to not be memorable. Don't foul up the swim meet. The easiest way is not knowing the rules. And then we get a call from the team saying, so-and-so did X, that wasn't in the rules. They weren't fair, they weren't impartial. You wanna be memorable for having an efficient meet and doing a good job. Not for the reason somebody had to call or send a photo of you as the referee doing something you shouldn't have done. You'll see this a couple different times throughout this presentation, but the ASA rule book is in a link here to the bottom. It is also posted on the ASA Swimtopia website under rules and regulations. If you are a new or newer uh, or a non-technology based referee, really encourage you to print that rule book, keep it in your bag with you, keep it in your car, highlight it for key areas. You never know when you're gonna need to pull that uh, rule book out to confirm something either the day of or during the meet if there is a situation that comes up. If not, highlight that on your phone, keep it as a bookmark so you can open it at any point in time if you need to during the swim meet. Um, but please make sure that you've read that rule book a couple times. And if you read it thoroughly, you'll lock that in your brain pretty well. Key piece, the last page of our, our rule book is about sportsmanship. This is our guide to everything that we do. If you keep sportsmanship in front of mind, that helps create fun, that helps create structure. Uh, similar to weather delays, if a sportsmanship issue comes up, you have to be the independent voice of reason. Everybody's gonna be amped up because they heard thunder or everybody's gonna get amped up if I thought my kid got first, but you, the place judge said they got second, you are intended to be that independent, unbiased voice of reason that can help calm down the situation. If adults or swimmers are not acting in the spirit of sportsmanship, you may have to intervene. If you do incur any sportsmanship violations, call Frankie on your drive home or email him in the parking lot before you leave. We would rather hear from you before we hear that potentially biased team call and report an incident. So we'll have this here later in the presentation, but keep in mind, if it's something minor, err on the side of caution and send Frankie an email. If it's something you think he's gonna hear about from the teams and it's somewhat major, please pick up the phone and give him a call uh, on your drive home. Materials, ASA rule book. We just, you'll see it again. You see the link below. Go ahead and pop in there, pull that up on the side. All these white boxes that you'll see through the presentation are direct snippets from our rule book. Re review the procedures for running a swim meet, as well as the USA swimming technical rules details. Keep that rule book with you all the time. Your ASA referee shirt and whistle. If you're doing the in-person, it's at Marist. A few of you guys in the virtual training asked to pick yours up at Marist as well, or pick those up at Frankie's house uh, or my house, and hopefully that's convenient for you guys. Dates to mention. For the most part, DeKalb teams and in-town teams typically swim on Tuesdays. Our Cherokee, our Central, our North, and our West. So our, our Forsyth, most of Fulton, Cherokee, uh, and our East teams, those are the Thursday night meets. As Frankie mentioned at the beginning, we are heavier in meets on the Thursday meets than we are on Tuesdays. So again, if you have any update to do that you're now available on Thursdays, uh, please go ahead and, and refine us so we can have kind of that on-call list. As a note, certain meets in DeKalb start at 6 p.m. and all Cherokee meets start at 6 p.m. All the other meets start at 5.30. So when you get that uh, referee list of where you're gonna be working, please verify the time that it's a 5.30 or a six o'clock meet. Order of difference is a couple things that are different. Uh, if you've never done a DeCab meet on the right-hand screen, you'll notice that DeCab only has 76 events. So long ago, the historical DeCab County teams did not swim long freestyle. And instead they go right into the 100 IMs after the medley relay. So a little bit of a different order of events. Similarly, in ASA, legacy ASA, in the Fulton Leagues, you had a long freestyle uh, that runs right after the short free. So if you're, if you're not familiar with doing a DeKalb meet, please take a look at the order of events 
and don't be surprised if you see a different order of event. What to wear to swim meet, your uniform. All you guys, if you don't already, some of you have that from years prior, an ASA official's white polo shirt. If for whatever reason you have a bad stain and you haven't picked up your new ASA shirt, a white polo shirt is the default. It helps you to stand out from a lot of the parents. It allows everybody who's looking for that person in the white polo shirt is their referee. Preferably, it's ironed in, tucked in. We do want to look professional. And if it's been sitting in the back of your car balled up, it doesn't give off the best uh, perception. Blue or khaki shorts, uh, preferable. That helps everybody consistently see from week to week they know what that official looks like. Couple things, everybody packs something different to take to the meet. We've already mentioned bringing that ASA rule book with you either digitally or preferably in paper form. Bring a backpack or a bag of any essentials that you think you might need during the night. If you've checked the weather forecast and it looks like there's a chance of rain, bring a raincoat. If you need to put a raincoat on over your polo shirt because it's raining, that's okay. Bring a spare shirt if you think it's gonna rain because you don't wanna go home in a soaking wet shirt sometimes. Sunscreen, it does get warm. Uh, if you're susceptible to sunburns, there is glare coming off the pool. Glare is another good reason to have sunglasses with you. There's a couple key reasons for sunglasses. One, there's glare in the pool. And secondly, there's about 500 eyes that will be on you. If you look away from lane six and you look into the diving well for a minute, somebody might say he wasn't paying attention to the pool. Sunglasses help avoid that perception. But just remember, if you're wearing your sunglasses, once it gets dark at night after nine o'clock, it's also not a good look to still be wearing your sunglasses. Bring a hat, bring a writing utensil, pencil or pen. Sometimes you want both just in case there's rain, you may be able to either easier write uh, with a pen or pencil given the conditions you're in. Bring your whistle. Some sites will have automated timing, Electronic timing, other sites won't. But even if you have electronic timing, always bring your whistle because if you have a false start or an emergency, a whistle is what gets people's attention. Before the swim meet, when you get your, uh, your assignments that are gonna be sent out today, tomorrow, take a look at those teams. Go onto the ASA website, see who those contacts are for the home team and make sure that you contact that home team at least 24 hours prior to the meet. Confirm your attendance. That home team rep is looking to hear from you so that they have that confirmation that they have a referee. Things to confirm. What time does your meet start? Again, the rule book's gonna say 5.30 or six o'clock depending upon the location, just confirm. Any specific site level details, parking. A lot of sites will go ahead and reserve a parking space for a referee, but it's not guaranteed. If they don't have a guaranteed uh, referee parking spot, you might wanna get there five minutes earlier because you might be walking a couple hundred yards from street parking or parking lot uh, for your, uh, to the pool. Any site specific details around the starting system? Again, do they use an infinity system, an omega system, a bullhorn and a whistle? Familiarize yourself if you haven't used that system before, just know if you haven't used an electronic system, you may want to get there a couple minutes early and test it out a few extra times. If you don't know the area, ask about normal traffic slowdown around 5 p.m. If you get on a Google map at 10 o'clock at night, the traffic pattern is going to look very different than at 4.30 or 5 o'clock during a, an evening rush hour. A day or two before, put a little reminder to plug in that address at 4.30 or 5.00 and see what that traffic pattern really looks like. If rain is in the forecast, encourage the teams, they should already be doing this, but encourage the teams to align on a weather plan. What happens if we have thunder? Will people stay at the pool? Is there ample safe space around the pool deck? Do you go to the parking lot? Do you go to the local Publix or Kroger parking lot to wait out the storm? Confirm a contact name and a phone number for the home team rep. Write that down on a post-it note along with write down Frankie's phone number if you don't already have it in your phone. Because you never know, are you gonna, is your car gonna break down? Are you, God forbid, be in a car accident? Is traffic gonna jam you up on the way to the pool the day of the meet? If you have that home team rep's phone number, you can call them and say, hey, there's a bad accident in front of me. 
I'm probably going to get there at 545. That allows them to know, let's go find somebody to start the meet and you're on your way. Otherwise, those teams are freaking out and they're calling wondering what's going on. We know we confirmed is our referee safe because they actually do care about us. So keep those things in mind, print those things out. Participation rules. This is a great section of the rule book to familiarize yourself with because if something contentious comes up, it may very well be about participation rules. Teams should be working through this as they, um, as they share their meet entries and work through this, but every now and then something slips through the crack Somebody thinks somebody might be cheating or is having an unfair advantage. Um, and a participation rule may come into question and they may bring this to you. Typically, individuals are able to swim two individual events. And once all individuals in an age group swim two events, then a swimmer can swim three. That's our way of evening the playing field between small and large teams. So in theory, if there are six individual events, and I only have one swimmer in that age group, that person can swim every individual event. Swimmers can swim up on relays but and don't have to swim up on individual events. So take an example of if I have a 15 and over age group where I only have three swimmers, I can take that voluntary brave soul as a six and under, swim them up on a relay, but that person can still swim six and under individual events. If an individual swims up individually, like that six and under wants to swim in the seven eights, they have to become a seven eight swimmer for the duration of all the individual events in that, in that meet. It's unlikely that an issue will arise, but please, please, please make yourself familiar because you can help diffuse this situation before this becomes an escalation item. Highlighted below is the substitution rules. Please make a look at that as well. Substitutions can make, be made up to 30 minutes before a meet starts. Remember, teams are swapping meet entries a day before. Somebody might get sick. Heaven forbid COVID still exists. If there is an issue that is within the league rules, why there's a reason for substitutions, those can happen up to 30 minutes before the meet starts. Effectively, once the meet starts, it's locked. We use judgment, but keep an eye on that for participation rules. Evan, one thing to point out that yep. this next rule is the changes Evan referenced. The substitutions are, the way that works is you can fill in for somebody that just can't be at the meet. What you can't do is just make cold cell changes to your lineup. Just because now you've seen the other team's lineup, the substitutions are specifically tied into um, again, filling in for people that are unable to be at the meet. And again, those are supposed to take place up to 30 minutes before the meet starts. Relay changes, however, they can take place throughout the meet. The coaches can take the relays literally on the block if they wanted to. And those are just uh, restrictions along with that. Yeah, good call. And that, that ultimately we want to be able to, to be flexible. If somebody's, if somebody's hurt or something comes up, that's in the spirit of the sport, doing a change because, oh, Johnny's swimming that and Johnny's a Swim Atlanta kid. That's really not in the spirit of this. So keep that in mind as your ground, grounding rules there. Uh, Dean and Kate just asked a question. Unless a coach brings it to our attention, how will we know if a substitution issue has occurred? It's likely that you won't. Effectively, and, and Frankie, correct me if I misspeak, a coach has got to be really confident that there's an infraction and there's some sort of uh, issue, they're gonna be the ones to bring it to our attention. And that's one of those sportsmanship items where we take the, okay, let's take a look at that. Let's understand what's going on. Bring the other team's coach over and say, hey, somebody brought up a substitution issue. Let's talk through this. Did this happen? What are the rules? How do we follow that? What precipitated that change? Yeah, to echo what Evan was saying, it, it substitution for Dean and Kate, they're really, taking place in the background. It's not something that really should hit your radar unless somebody comes up and says, wait a minute, you know, they're making changes after you know, the meet has started, you know, that that again, that's not something you're going to actively try and police. It's going to be, it's more or less going to be brought, you're, you're 
um, to, to manage. Otherwise, like I said, you would assume that everything's going according. Rules on swimsuits in dual meets. It is extremely unlikely there'll be an incident that you need to enforce. Uh, we do not in ASA have a rule about wearing jewelry. If you're part of the Woodfield swim team, but you wear your Centennial High School swim cap, okay. If you're not supporting your local swim team as much, that's okay. We do not enforce that aspect. Uh, USA Swimming does talk about tech suits not for children under 12 years old. I don't think you're ever going to see a, somebody under 12 wear a tech suit to a dual meet. And if a 15 year old wears a $300 tech suit and wears it out at a backyard swim meet, they have some money I hope to have in my life. But this is just a, a simple awareness on page 14 to be aware of. Arrival at swim meets. Ideally, you're going to want to arrive about 30 minutes or target being there 30 minutes ahead of time. That gives you a little bit of grace period if you hit a couple extra red lights or if traffic grows on your way to the pool. Do not arrive less than 15 minutes before the start of the meet. You're already in trouble if you start up 15 minutes ahead of time. And that's only because of all of the pre-meet items are gonna to be tough to get done, get comfortable and be de-stressed if you only arrive 15 minutes before meet starts. Remember we mentioned this early, referee parking is not an expectation, it's a gift if a, if a team has that. That also buys you a little bit of time if you're targeting being there 30 minutes early. Upon arrival, check in with the home team coach. Get a heat sheet, start reviewing that. Look at the heat sheet for combined races. Typically, a team should be looking at that ahead of time to see where they can combine. We've moved completely over to Meet Maestro this year, and so one way to see is if you see a medley relay of girls, for example, 13, 14 girls, and the swimmers are in lanes one, two, and three, and the 13, 14 boys are in lanes four, five, and six, that should be a visual cue that the teams have already moved those lanes to say, to yep, say yes, that yes, that yes, yes, yes. Okay. One thing that's often overlooked is long freestyle and IM. That's a key one for referees to also look at and say, do we have the ability to combine some long freestyle? Long freestyle and IM and seven and eights can save three minutes for every combination that you can do. On the relays, it can save anywhere between three and five minutes. Those add up, those can add up anywhere between 15 and 40 minutes over the course of some meet. Okay, that's one of the efficiency plays that we bring to the table with ASA and you guys as referee is being able to combine some of those, those heats. Conduct a pre-meet meeting with both head coaches. Typically, that's 15 minutes before the visiting team is finishing their warm-ups. Say, hey, coach, can we borrow you for a couple minutes? Review those com combined heats. And then talk about DQ strictness. During meets one and two, we're usually pretty lenient. One-hand touches for younger kids may be something that we let go. Uh, we don't want to give on things that give a strategic advantage. If some kid swims freestyle for the first half of a race, but you guys said, hey, no DQs and seven and eights, this one we got a distinct advantage and we're gonna wanna call that. Usually meets three through five, we want to call things by the book. And if you see that coaches in, in meets three and four are like, ah, no DQs, it's okay for us to encourage, okay, we're in meet three and four guys, we need to show that we have proficiency because we are trying to help kids understand uh, what rules right and wrong are for the sport. If coaches are not aligned on strictness, the stricter rules abide. So if you get in meet three and one coach still wants to be a little bit leaning on eight and under one hand touches, but the other says, call it by the book, we call it by the book. We do not take time like you would see in USA Swimming to go tell every individual why they were disqualified we make a point one to add the reason code into Meet Maestro so the coach can look after the meet as to all the reasons that their individuals uh, or relays were disqualified. But we want to tell a coach or a designated representative why there was a DQ. This doesn't always have to be verbal and for the most part shouldn't, but find out who that person is going to be so that you can let that person know throughout the course of the meet if you do have a disqualification and what's that for. 
We'll see that in a couple of videos here later of how you signal a disqualification and probably that coach or that representative is going to be looking for you to raise your hand to call a DQ. And then when you can, how you would then let them know either through a, a small hand gesture or they'll come over to talk to you depending upon how you guys uh, align before the meet on what a DQ is. We mentioned about weather plans. Ask what that weather plan is. It's not uncommon for a team to say, oh, we haven't talked about it yet. It's easier to have that conversation at 515 than after it starts thundering and people running to their cars. Accommodations needed. You may have hearing impaired, visually impaired um, swimmers who need any level of special accommodations. Always ask that. If somebody says, yes, Johnny has an accommodation, he needs to start in the water. We have a hearing impaired swimmer, we need a special start. Circle those heats in your heat sheet so that you have that called out in advance because we always want to accommodate uh, any special needs requests. Confirm the pool depth and the diving plans. Again, the teams should already have uh, measured the depth of their pool and that determines, can you start from a dive or do you need to start in the water? This is specifically impact with the 25 ends for the little kids doing relays. If a pool is less than four feet deep, they're gonna be starting from in the water. An awareness for you when you're looking down at relays. The last piece to, to understand is, will the 25 events be starting at the far end of the pool or will everything be starting at the starting end? You see for the 25 events, do you have to tell the timers, timers go to the other end because everything starts at the starting end and then finishes at the 25 for those short races, or do swimmers start at the 25 end and the timers do not move throughout the course of the, uh, of the meet. Those things, that checklist takes you maybe five to 10 minutes. So arriving that 30 minutes before allows you to work through those details, exhale, get ready for the meet, have a glass of water. If you're showing up right at 15 minutes before the meet, it's tough to do all these things and not be stressed out. As we said, starting depth for blocks, ask this, ask this, ask this. We are here to make sure there's fun, but we really wanna make sure there's safety involved uh, as well. If it is not four feet deep, they cannot dive, pretty simple. Just because the water is deep enough, swimmers are not required to dive in or use a block. They can start in the water if they're more comfortable. If you happen to see a pool that says four feet on the tile, but it looks like somebody backwashed the pool and it looks like it's about 10 inches below, err on the side of caution and ask the home team, let's measure this or when was the last time you measured it because it's not looking safe, okay? We always tell our team, pools have been replastered, go by what they measured at the beginning of the season, okay? This is section 18 in page 15 of your rule book to read through. Inclement weather plans, as we said, priority one, this is on page 15 and 16, is about safety. As we said in the beginning on sportsmanship, be that impartial voice of reason. If it's not safe, it probably isn't safe. Representatives from each team align on the decision for a swim meet, not just the home team. We do have conditions in the rule book. This is a key piece for you guys to read through and be very, very familiar with what happens if there is uh, a rain delay. We have opportunities to either reschedule the meet if the team's aligned that they want to reschedule. We have things called a weather tie. That's if we can't agree and everybody wants a win so they get a trophy at the end of the season, we help support getting trophies for weather ties or wins and losses. Down at the bottom of the screen talks about what happens after if the meet's been going on for X number of events and there's a point spread, there is some prescriptive language about calling it a win or a loss and go home. If not, there's always a weather tie. So please familiarize yourself with this. If the meet is rescheduled, don't leave. Don't leave until you align that with the home team to say, you guys have decided that the, the meet's gonna take place Saturday morning at 10 a.m. They already know you, you now know the pool. Check your schedule to see if you're available. If you're available, boom, confirm that you'll be there and let Frankie know, hey, we're rescheduled, I've confirmed I'll be there. 
if the home team and the away team decide that they're rescheduling for Friday night at nine o'clock and you've got a concert to go to, just tell them to contact Frankie and we'll find a new referee. Okay. The new meet does not have to work in your schedule, but if it does, everybody wins. Guys, if you have a rescheduled meet and you know that you can't work, the teams aren't always great at communicating that with us as a league. Just in case, a quick phone call, text, or email to me. Hey, by the way, they did reschedule for Friday night, and I cannot be there. Let me know. Same thing applies. If you can be there, just again, we want to kind of keep tabs on that, make sure that all these meetings are covered. But again, if you know that you can't be there and you know that they have rescheduled for a certain date, get that info to me as quickly as you can so we can get the wheels rolling on on getting that. One other thing, Evan, if you don't mind, if I'll interject on the inclement weather. The, the big thing here, guys, is the, there's a certain, you know, they're not allowed to wait an unlimited amount of time, okay? Unless both teams are in full agreement, they say, look, we'll stay here till late dark and both teams are on board and there's not a whole lot of conflict on that. That's fine. You're going to get paid overtime, Okay. However, if they don't align on how long they want to wait, the rule book is incredibly clear on how long they can wait. It essentially either has to be rescheduled or called. Okay. Also keep in mind, there is not a set number of events that a meet has to get to in order to be disposed of. Okay. Now, as far as declaring, you know, one team winner and one team did not win the meet, yes, there are some, you know, there's some good language in there. But you do have to get past a certain number of events, and one team has to be ahead by a certain number to be able to say this team won and this team lost. But they don't get to that point. They don't get halfway through the meet. But one team's not up by enough points, then that weather tie option, that's on the table. If they can't line up and go, hey, look, we'll come back tomorrow night. You know, if, if one team to say, look, half our team's going to be gone, coaches are out, we just can't make this work. Well, the simple solution at that point is, it's a weather tie. Both teams get credited a win. We move on. We live to fight another day. But it's crucial for you guys to understand every last aspect of that weather situation rule. Number one, understand, you know, look, if they can't agree on how long to wait, well, the rule book says you're going to wait up to a certain amount of time after a thunder or lightning delay. And at that point, if we get to that, you know, that, that point is expired, there's only one more, you know, window of about 15 to 30 minutes where the teams will wait at which point they just have to go okay we're going to move on again if both teams align and then say hey, look we'll wait on what the rule book says we'll wait two hours we'll wait till you know nine o'clock to start again that's not you know that's not a problem you're you're kind of there to help them you're not there to you know drive you know the conversation on this you're there to be a mediator in situations where they can't align and figure out what to do and they can't go, okay, well, wait a minute. The rule book says this real clearly, but you know, for a fact, Hey, look, the rule book says we're going to wait this long, you know, for a weather delay. And if we can't agree, well, then fine. We're going to move on to step two, which is dispose of the meeting, schedule it, call it, whatever you got to do. But knowing that up and down back and forth is really crucial. Don't guess, know it. Oh, with absolute certainty. If you don't know it, pull it up in your rule book. Again, you can avoid teams from having a conflict because one situation teams tend to really struggle with with regards to conflict, this is it. This is where we really kind of, you know, we, we have issues. Not to say it happens a bunch, but when it does, it's again, it's just obviously not a very pleasant situation. I'm going to cover to you, Evan. Yeah, last piece in your pre meet meeting. Understand if there is weather in the forecast, who is that weather designate? Typically, that's a lifeguard at the pool. But if you think you heard some reverb from the PA system or somebody feels like they heard thunder, everybody becomes a lifeguard in their own opinion. If you know who that weather person is in advance, you can look to them to be the one who is not only we heard thunder, we need to clear the pool, but they're the one keeping tabs on the 30 minutes to then restart uh, after we hear thunder. Weather delay procedure, Frankie kind of covered that uh, in, in quite a bit uh, of detail there. That's all on page 15 and 16. If you have something come up 
pull the, the head rep should just be one person from each team along with the coach. So there should be five of you in that meeting. Again, what Frankie said, you're there to mediate. Talk about how long are we gonna delay? What's going on? What are you seeing in the radar? Allow them. If you have a lot of people crowding that group, I'd encourage you to think about, do you need to go take five steps away so not everybody has an opinion? You just have those five people with you. Uh, read the rule book if people are not aligned and how to declare a winner if it's due to weather, okay? Pre-meet, at the start of the meet, you wanna make sure that primarily you are instructing the place judge and the recorder on what their roles are. That is on page seven of your rule book. You'll remind them how to write down the order of finish in their heat sheet and to not allow other influencers to sway them. How they see the end of a race, we use, unless there's electronic timing system, we use human eyeballs to determine the order of finish. Not if somebody stopped a stopwatch because they had jumpy fingers or they had delayed fingers. We wanna use humans. We have a procedure we'll talk about in a second. What if they don't agree? But you wanna instruct place judges, their job is to write down the order of finish vertically in their heat sheet. If there is a disagreement, let's say you're in a six lane pool, you'll have two place judges. One person saw lane four, one person saw lane three. If they have a disagreement, they will look to you, the referee, to break the tie if you saw the order of finish clearly. If you didn't, just say, sorry, I didn't see it. And that will go in the scorebook as a tie for first place. If you saw the result clearly, you can then break the tie. The judge's recorder will write down the final order and then they'll pass that on to go get all the times from the, uh, from the master recorder. The judges will have the, the, uh, the master recording sheet. That is where you will write down any of your disqualifications. We'll show this here in a couple of slides, but if you have a disqualification for an event, you will write it on that paper copy uh, form and that will make its way into our, our computer system. Okay, we'll look at those here in just a couple of minutes. Again, five minutes before the start of the meet. Confirm that all your timers are in position. If you have an electronic timing system, do a test start. Make sure you're comfortable with it. You don't have any feedback. Everybody knows what it sounds like. The timers are aware. Advise the timers how to flag your attention. If they have an equipment failure, what if their stopwatch freaks out? What if they drop it in the pool? Hollering your name is not a good idea because sometimes the swim meets are noisy. Oftentimes the best thing to tell timers, wave your arm or reach out and wave your hand over uh, the front of the, the block in front of the pool because you're gonna see that visual cue before you then start the next race and you'll know there's a reason that you need to stop. Advise your timers of your commands. What are you gonna say before heat one and subsequent heats? For example, event one, 600 girls, 100 freestyle relays. Timers and judges ready, swimmers take your mark, beep, go. For heat two, you're probably just going to say, heat two, step up, 100 yard freestyle relay, swimmers take your mark, go. You may have a different command just to keep the meat flowing, but know that there's a continuation of that same event. Identify the backup timer. There should be somebody who's looking for those hands to raise from the timers. If they didn't get a start of an event, that backup timer can then get a timed finish for that lane uh, if that timer uh, fouled up their time uh, stopwatch for some reason. Have timers confirm the swimmer's name one heat prior to when they go in the water. Most of these younger kids are gonna have their name written on their shoulder in a Sharpie. It's an easy way for them to reflect. Key piece as well, if they've written it on their, their arm, or let's say they're starting on the 25 end and a timer doesn't actually get to confirm that before they start, they can follow up with the swimmer when they get out of the water. The thing you don't wanna have timers do, and please instruct timers of that, if they didn't confirm that kid's name before they get on the block and that swimmer is now under your verbal command, encourage the timers, don't grab a kid and say, hey, what's your name again? While you're in the middle of saying swimmers, take your mark. Okay. Prior to the start of the meet, two minutes before the meet starts, look to see if six and unders are lining up. The hardest thing for us to do 
is to get heat one started. If you don't see six and unders lining up, and it's a couple minutes before, go look for that coach from that team. Look at your heat sheet, confirm how many kids are supposed to be in heat one of event one. And if you don't see those guys on both sides of the pool, start looking for a coach. Like clockwork, once that first event goes, things just start to start rolling in place. But that sometimes can take a few minutes if you're passively waiting on teams to get their six and unders to the blocks. So using your heat sheet, this is a key piece. We just kind of talked about this two slides ago. Easy way for you, you as a ref, maintain the order of events and the current status. Many referees will just draw a line through that heat once it's completed. That way now you have a visual cue that the next event is event three, the seven, eight, 100 yard medley relay. Boom, heat one's done, moving on. Disqualifications. Primarily, we do not DQ exhibition swimmers unless a coach specifically asks you to do so. If you have a DQ in an event, circle that swimmer if it's on a relay and write down the write down the reason in your shorthand notes. Let's say false start, false start number four, or breaststroke kick on butterfly. Write that down. What that does is a couple things for us. It allows you to not have to go run to the to the judge's recorder and write down the DQ immediately when it happens, but you now have that that written record. That helps you for two reasons. If you have an exhibition heat right after that, that gives you time to go write down that disqualification reason during the, sorry, during the exhibition heat because you're not as focused on calling DQs in an exhibition heat as you are a live scoring heat. Secondly, if a coach comes up to you 10 minutes later, you're not having to go wonder where's that place judges form you have the DQ reason right there in your heat sheet and you can have a quick conversation uh, with one of the coaches. Close races, like we just mentioned, you have two place judges who disagree on the order of finish. Go ahead and write down the order of finish in your heat sheet. Hey, I saw four over three. If the judges are at one end for 25s and you're starting at the other end and you see that close race, write it down. You don't know if they're going to come back and say, hey, we disagreed on something, but then you have a record that you can go back and reference pretty easily, even a couple heats later, say, yeah, I actually did see that finish. It was lane four, then lane three. If you didn't see, again, it's a tie. Starting protocols. ASA does not use USA Swimming's whistle protocols. Swimmers on neighborhood teams understand words more than they understand whistles. Remember, when they go to a neighborhood pool, a whistle means a lifeguard is trying to get my attention or it's adult swim. They don't know what five or six whistles means versus one whistle. We use word commands to get the upcoming swimmer and the next heat's attention. As we said before, starting commands for heat one would go event 37, Eight and under girls, 25 backstroke, heat one, step up, step in the water, place your feet, one length of backstroke. It's okay for you to have a little bit of latitude in this. Seven eights, if you feel like you want to remind them that the order of an IM is butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, freestyle, that's okay. When we get to heat two and subsequent exhibition heats, heat two, step up, 25 backstroke, take your mark, beat. Focusing on this amount of commands will help you drive down five, six, seven seconds per heat. When we have 200 heats in an evening, that helps save 10, 15 additional minutes. Again, think about this for a second. If you've saved 30 minutes in combining relays and long events, plus just these simple starting command changes, you've now saved 45 minutes or more uh, in a swim meet. Folks, we really try to target getting meets done for the biggest teams in our league in three and a half hours. Giving commands prior to the previous heat clearing the pool, we call that flyover starts. When the last swimmer goes underneath the flags, begin your command sequence for the next heat. So if I'm in a six lane pool and that sixth swimmer comes underneath the flags, that's when I wanna start saying heat two, step up, 25 freestyle. Swimmers, take your mark. 
those instructions just took mm, about five seconds. And that should be ample time for that swimmer, that last swimmer to touch the wall, the timer to look at their time and reset. If you're trying to gauge how much time you should take in that process, you should assume you don't have to look at all six lane timers to know that they're all ready for the next heat. You really should be paying attention to that sixth place timer. Watch their hand. Did they show the time to the recorder? Reset their watch, boom, you can hit start. Again, 200 heats, that can save 20 to 30 minutes over the course of a meet. All right, let's do a little bit interactive on kind of what this sounds like. A very simple starting sequence. If you are at a pool that still uses a whistle and bullhorn, the way Chandler has presented that is exactly how we want to, to maintain. We'll see this in another picture in a second, but you see the place judges. Two of them are sitting side by side at the order of finish, and a judge's recorder is sitting just opposite them to then confirm what the finished places are. With Chandler starting right here, this is where he would be writing down whatever DQs he had from the previous heat. I want to just give a quick example of how a few seconds makes a difference in when you start planning your commands. So on the left-hand side of the screen, look at how preparing for the subsequent heat, this is an exhibition heat, and looking back to confirm the completion, this takes about nine seconds. <laughs> So if you notice, he had already given some commands to say, heat two, go ahead, hop in the water. And he looked back at the 25 at the start, at the finishing end rather, to see that the last swimmer was done. And now at this point, he's just saying, okay, swimmers, take your mark, go. That process takes about nine seconds. On the flip side, At this point in time, this is when we would want to start calling that next heat to the blocks. And take a notice, we're at 18 seconds in this clip. We should be now announcing the next heat step up. Sometimes there's gonna be conditions where you say, hey, you know what, we just had an issue. There's a cap, there's something in the pool. That's okay. Take the time because you've already put time in the bank from combining heats or doing this process throughout the meet that it's okay to take a little bit extra time. But on normal course of operation, right here is when we would be calling that next heat to the blocks. Again, we're 18 seconds in, see how much time, quote, we could have saved. And now I screwed that up. Let's see. Hey, 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 hey. So in, in that example, I don't know if you guys could see the time, the time elapsed. There was an added five seconds from going underneath the flags until that person touched the wall. And net, net, at some swim meets that would look like, hey, we're looking pretty efficient, but there was 20 seconds from the time that last swimmer was underneath the flags to the time that next event actually went off. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, Dean's bringing up a great point. Find that it's often that place judges ignore instructions to write places separately and one judge calls out place while the other writes that down, okay? When, if you reaffirm that with the place judges uh, on the front end of your meeting, you may have to reinforce that during the, um, during the meet. You want to encourage that place judge that it's their opinion and theirs only. As Frankie often tells the team, the worst person to be a place judge is a lawyer because they want to sit there and try to argue their way to a finish. That's not what they're there for. You may have to stop, encourage them. Oftentimes they'll actually switch halfway through the meet 
and they'll have a back half volunteer. So you may be reminding them uh, again. If you're doing a 50 like this event, you're going to be navigating yourself back towards the finishing end. And you're probably going to see how the place judges are operating because you are getting ready to announce the instructions for the next heat. If you see that behavior that, that, that Dean just wrote in the chat line, correct it. Don't allow it to go on because we're here to maintain the fun, but also the fairness of the swim meet. Good point, Dean. Thanks for throwing that out there. Electronic starting equipment. When you do a test start, there can be feedback. So test that ahead of time. Um, don't stand right next to the amplifier. You may get that feedback. It often sounds a lot like a start and could give you some subsequent false starts you don't really like. Uh, test the microphone prior to meet. Ensure the volume can be heard by the farthest lane. Make sure that you like the clarity of your voice. Sometimes you have to get that microphone really close to you. Sometimes you need it further away to be really clear. Locate where you can place the equipment when you walk the deck. Are you using electronic timing for the 25s? Do you have to rotate the, uh, the speakers so it can be heard on the 25 or there's speakers on both ends? Take a point to that, especially if you're unfamiliar. That's one of those key pieces. If you've asked before the meet, what sort of starting system are you using? We'll let you know, do you wanna get there a couple minutes early and make a point to make sure that you can effectively run the meet. What do you do if you have a meet that doesn't have electronic starting system? The same thing we did in 1980, 1990, and 1997. Use a bullhorn and a whistle. They're 30 bucks, most teams have them. Now, teams are also turning to portable microphones. Figure out the feel. If you have a whistle and a heat sheet and a bullhorn, you don't have three hands. Figure out kind of what's the easiest way for you to manage when you have to hold three things, but you have two hands. Do not allow teams. This happens every year. Uh, it's happening more and more, but they will have a team rep or a volunteer parent who is the PA announcer for the meet. That's great. That person is to help there to call kids to go to their team bullpens, to let you know that hot dogs and nachos and the pizza just showed up at the concession stand. That person is not there to announce the next heat to get on the blocks. A couple reasons by that. You have to command your swim meet. They don't know all the protocols that we just described a couple slides ago, and you will lose the efficiency and the cadence that effectively you are trained and training to do. You'll have some parents say, okay, heat one on the blocks. Here we go. Great meet, everybody. Not only is that possibly wrong, but you as a referee have now not commanded the attention of the swimmers. So if you see somebody who has that microphone, they're sitting on the, the, uh, the lifeguard stand, have a quick chat with them. Say, if you see me about to start an event or you see me with a microphone in hand, I need you to just wait on giving your announcements for the concession stand. Again, if it happens, have a nice casual conversation. If it happens a lot, that might be a time to go uh, let the head coach or the home team rep say, I need some help with that guy on the, uh, on the public address announcer. He's really kind of messing up the swimmer's ability to hear my starting commands. So can you have a chat with that person? Starting procedures for hearing impaired swimmers. Again, if we've had that conversation for accommodations, there is a simple procedure that, that we do if we have a swimmer who is hard of hearing. Try to have the coach introduce you to that swimmer before the meet if possible. Why? Hey, you've circled them in your heat sheet, but if you see them and you've made eye contact uh, and a quick introduction, makes that swimmer feel more comfortable that you have their interest in mind and they're gonna look for you uh, at the start of that event. Make eye contact with that swimmer to ensure they step up on the block. And we'll watch kind of what that procedure looks like. When you do take your mark, you'll start with your hand. First, when, when they step up, your hand goes over your head. At take your mark, your arm comes at a 90 degree angle. And when you beep, you drop your arm to your side. Let's see what that looks like. Very simple. Again, this is summer league. If you tell a coach ahead of time, if you want to stand behind the block just to make sure that kid sees my arm movement and takes off, that's just fine. Oh 
ASA, exceptions to USA swimming technical rules. Primarily, this is about false starts, okay? In USA swimming, they let false starts just go and there's a disqualification after the fact. In our dual meets, for the first false start, use the whistle or an electronic uh, starting system to recall the heat. You wanna restart if you can. If you're using electronic timing and you have a whistle, blow your whistle also. They're gonna recognize that that's a sound that's not familiar and they might stop. The entire heat gets that false start and we then restart the heat. If there is a subsequent false start after you restart, allow the heat to keep swimming and disqualify that swimmer who false started the second time around. It's very unlikely that that's going to happen, but probably once a meet, maybe twice a meet, you're going to have a swimmer who false starts and you bring them back. If you have a 15 year old who swam 50 yards all out because they didn't, nobody could stop that swimmer and they didn't hear your whistle, it's also okay for you to say, hey, we're gonna move on to the next event to give those guys a, a second to, to catch their breath and then restart them. Just make a couple announcements of what event you're moving to. And subsequently, we've come back to swim event 36, the boys 15 and over race. If you see some little kids, again, they might be wobbly on the blocks. If they didn't get an unfair advantage, don't call a false start. If somebody's rocking, if somebody jumps off the block early and they have gained a competitive advantage, then absolutely call the false start. Lane assignments, exhibition heats. A home team is going to be in the even lanes, visitor team in the odd lanes. For exhibition heats, there are no prescribed uh, lanes anymore. With our move to Swimtopia and Meet Maestro, it then seeds exhibition heats based on entry times. So that should also help us be a little bit more efficient in the timing of, of our meets. Teams should only have one heat of exhibition maximum for long free IM and medley and free relays. If you happen to see a heat three in a medley relay because you went to a pool that has its Chastain and Brookwood Hills and there's 600 swimmers, just talk to the coaches ahead of time. If they say, yep, we know, we cover that. We just have a massive uh, pair of teams, understandable. But we really try to say, limit the number of long freestyle NIMs to no more than one heat of exhibition. For exhibition entry limits, we talked about participation rules uh, earlier. Swimmers who are swimming in live scoring events can swim in one exhibition event. But if you're only swimming in exhibition events, you swim two individual events as exhibition. The role of meet volunteers. So we talk about place judges, two or three. You'll have a third place judge if you have a, have a pool that has more than six lanes. They are there to get that visual order of finish. As we saw in that first video with Chandler, they wanna sit as close to the finish line as possible so they can clearly see who touched first, who touched second. Most meets will use those two place judges. Some will have three. If there's three, it comes from the home team. Simply put, look at the top, top picture here. That's all they need to do. Write down lane two, lane three, lane four, lane five. They'll then compare those and the judges recorder who is sitting in that third chair will compare the two and write them down at the top of his page. They'll then translate that into the actual order of finish by lane and then we'll subsequently get the, uh, the lane timers forms. When using electronic timing, the push buttons are used for order of finish and the place judges are back up. Meet workers, relevant roles for the referees, page seven and page eight. This gives you a better description, not only of what those roles are supposed to do, but also what we say that the starter referee is supposed to do. You guys get a little more of a comprehensive training here, but the teams are going to have read this. So make sure at a minimum, you're doing what the teams think you're supposed to be doing. Familiarize yourself with these key volunteers. Those are the people you're going to be interacting with the most place judge, judges, recorders, timers. Remember, some of these guys might be first time volunteers, so never assume that they really know the role. If they say, oh, I've done this before, good. Then you're not gonna need me to tell you too many times tonight. There you go. Layout for meets. As you said, referee stands 
right about at the flags to start me. Never start your races at the six yard mark opposite the flags because your view is blocked of, of the actual swimmers. Stand about four to five yards out. You'll have these place judges right next to you. Judge recorded behind them. Then somebody goes, gets all the times from the lanes. They make their way back up to the computer table. Again, if you have a 25, make sure you understand, are the swimmers gonna start from the far end? Or do the timers move to the far end for the 25 events? Duration of the meet. Key behaviors, walk the deck, especially in heat one. It gives better awareness and observation for disqualifications and allows you to see order of finish. Do not just stand at the starting of, of the end of the pool. You're not gonna give the perception that you care or that you're paying attention. Don't turn your back to the pool. Somehow we actually did run swim meets before cell phones were invented. Keep your eyes off your phone, unless you're looking for the radar. Uh, it's the best advice I can give you about staying off your cell phone. We said wear sunglasses, helps with the pool glare, and it disguises if you look away for a moment. Don't DQ exhibition swimmers. And if you know the coach of the other pool, be friends after the meet. It's okay to go say, hey, haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, haven't seen you since high school. That's great, but don't risk giving the impression that you might not be impartial. First call in 13, the sign box. But you see how that PA announcer did not get in the way of making an announcement. Starting made his call during the race. Walking the pool deck is simply as that. Let's people around the pool know that you're watching for legal swimming and gives a perception that you're engaged. Pretty simple. Get a couple steps, close some rings, make your Fitbit happy. USA Swimming Technical Rules. Again, this is on page 32 to 34. It's a big rule book. These three pages really call out uh, some technical rules for swimming. When in doubt, give the summer league swimmer the benefit of the doubt. If you see one flutter kick on butterfly, is that something that you should be disqualifying them for? But if you see that on every kick, it's a very different story. Read the rule book again. Basic rules for, for strokes and turns is all, are all spelled out there. If you see a disqualification, raise your hand like Chandler just did. Only problem with what Chandler just did there, in my opinion, keep your hand up for a little bit longer because you're not necessarily confident that that coach saw you call a disqualification. If you leave your hand up for five, six seconds, you raise your hand fully, your entire hand up to help call a disqualification. Transcribing your disqualifications to the recorder. Don't miss action in a live heat to, to transcribe disqualification. Wait, if you've written it in your heat sheet, you're not losing time. When you're on heat two or heat three, go back to that recorder sheet and you can say, hey, I've got a disqualification, go ahead and hold those sheets. I'll come back to you in a minute and I'll write down the reason why. Walk over, grab the sheet, write the reason code. Try not to delay the meet for a DQ transcription. Frankie, so I'm off mute. Go ahead. But one thing to point out on the DQs, um, it's okay. You don't necessarily have to write it on the place judge's form. If you want to tell the place judge, but just be specific as to what the reason was for the DQ. It was a one hand touch. Make sure the lane is correct. Okay. And like Evan said, you don't have to do it immediately but again the, the big thing is also don't wait too long because that piece of paper gets filled out and it moves its way away from the place judges quickly so you know worst case scenario if you have to take an extra few seconds for a dq and heat one and again heat one's going to be the only one where you can disqualify somebody take the extra 10 seconds walk over tell the place judge, hey lane forward disqualified one hand touch and make sure that they know that they need to write down that reason. So again, it gets communicated through the chain, it gets to the coaches, and same thing. Uh, communicate with the coach, and Evan will probably cover that in just a second. Um, one other thing to note, when Evan talked about Chandler and raising his hand, I, I've always felt, you know, before you raise your hand, 
honestly try and figure out where that coach is and that kid. And before your hand goes up, see if they're looking at you. Because in a lot of cases, that's the first thing they're going to do. They're going to get, they're going to, if you were raising your hand and they're staring right at you, they pretty much confirm they knew their kid did something wrong. It's not a it's not a slam dunk and it's not, you know, direct evidence of a of a rules infraction, but it just reaffirms that the coach knows that the kid was going to get DQ. Why they're staring at you. Almost inevitable that they know that this is coming. That's why they're staring at you when your hand goes up. So just kind of a little, you know, small pro tip. So I'll get back to you, Evan. Just qualifications. We said always give them the, the benefit of the doubt. Unless you're hundred percent sure. Don't use a microscope. Don't DQ exhibition swimmers unless specifically instructed by their coach. Common things that we disqualify for, flutter kick on breaststroke or butterfly, especially at the start of a race, a one hand touch on breaststroke or butterfly, scissor kick on breaststroke, a backstroker is afraid of bumping their head on the wall so they roll over for their finish or for their turns. Maybe they take multiple freestyle pulls going into a backstroke flip turn because they're young and just learning how to do that. And then false starts on relays. Those are typically the five bullets, bullet points there that you may disqualify swimmers for. When you make that call, we said raise your hand. Don't hold up the number of fingers. Hey, it was lane two. We want to be inconspicuous. Raise your entire hand to signal disqualification. Side note, don't point at the, at the lane. Don't point at the kid. You don't want to draw more attention. Raising your hands already drawn attention that there's an issue. Write down the disqualification in your heat sheet. Circle the lane. Write down the reason code. Notify the place judge. We covered that already. How to tell the designated coach that there's a reason for a DQ. If you already know who you're looking for, or to Frankie's point, if that coach is looking at you and you've raised your hand, you might put your fingers right in front of your chest and just say, hey, lane two. Flutter kick. That is adequate to let that coach know, and they'll still have that backup record when they when they print their results. You don't want to holler across the pool because that's where that designated coach is and say, hey, lane two is flutter kicking. Now the whole world here, Jim, we're not there to embarrass kids. We're there to, to help them learn the sport uh, effectively. So think about that and talk through that in the pre-meet meeting. Disqualifications with added interests. Never, ever, 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 ever entertain parents about questions about disqualifications. Only speak to that coach, designate. Once you open that door, oh, it's going to be a miserable rest of the night because now somebody thinks they can talk to you. Right or wrong, if a parent comes up animated, encourage them to go talk to their coach and say, we only talk to coaches. That coach will come back or they might know that that parent is a little bit animated. If you deal with an aggressive coach over disqualification, it's your call. Be sure what you see before you call that DQ. You've already given that kid the benefit of the doubt, so be very sure that you saw that false start. False starts are usually the biggest one that gets people fired up. If you get to free relays and they think it's a close meet, their kid never left early. Never engage in a shouting match with a coach on deck. Reaffirm the violation of what you saw. Remember, you're sometimes there to bring down uh, the level of excitement at a swim meet. If a coach does not disengage, ask for the team rep to come over and help. Sometimes the head coaches might be 18, 19 years old, and they need uh, a parent rep to say, okay, let's calm down. Let's take a step back. If you have something like this that needs to let Frank, you know, let him know after the meet, hey, I had an issue with this coach, just a heads up. It happens. It's not the end of the world. We might give that person some feedback to help them be a better coach and better sportsman. Overturning a disqualification. This should never happen because you read your rule book and you know what rules are and you're confident what you saw. But if you explain to a coach that, uh, hey, you DQ'd my kid for doing butterfly kicks on freestyle diving in underwater. And a coach comes back and says, no, look at the rule book. That's actually allowed. That's okay. Then you would overturn that, that rule. But allow that conversation to happen. And a coach may bring you back the rule book. Read the rule book, and this will never come up as a situation. 
at the end of the meet, tell the coach it's a good meet. Go ahead, Frank. I'm sorry. Just going back to what Evan was talking about and dealing with DQs and the occasionally amped up uh, coach or anybody else, I do not have a problem with the coach asking you about a qualification. It's their right and it's their job to, to advocate for their kids. There's nothing wrong with the coach coming up in a calm, professional manner. What happened at event 35? Who was disqualified? What lane was it? What was the call that you made? Those are reasonable questions that a coach should be entitled to ask at any time. What I do not have a lot of patience for are coaches to come over, you know, waving their arms, raising their voice, God forbid, using any kind of profanity. Those are, those are non-starters. Those should not happen. Okay. Same thing. Parent, the only parent that you talk to you is like the head team rep, that team. They, they have standing in those situations because they're essentially the general manager of the team. Again, any of those conversations, they've been told a thousand times. That should be a professional, calm conversation that takes place and is not something that sends a message to the kids, to the parents on the deck, that it's okay to sit there and, you know, scream at the referee. Again, that's not acceptable. And more importantly, if you can answer with confidence, I disqualified lane four. I'm certain it was lane four. This is the rules and fraction I pointed out that they've broken. That conversation is pretty much over because anything beyond that, they're questioning your judgment and theoretically your integrity, which again, I don't have patience for that. Okay. At that point, it's a, hey, I have made this call. I am not changing this call. This conversation is over. Okay. And again, the big thing here is you have to be the calm one in this conversation. And it may be difficult sometimes. Nobody likes being hollered at, okay? But you also have to look at this from the perspective of the coach. They think that they're doing right by their kid. They think that they're, you know, they're trying to protect them. But ultimately, again, this goes back to the whole concept of sportsmanship, and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So, again, we've got to walk the line here. But the more important thing is you can't take the bait. You can't escalate the situation. You have to be the calm one. You sit there and calmly listen. And more often than not, that's all they're looking for. They're looking for somebody to hear them out, to you know, hear them express their concerns. And some of maybe a little bit of theater on their part, where they're trying to save face and you know, send a message to the parents is like, look, yeah, I'm looking after your kid here. But at the same time, again, if you sit there and take the bait and you raise your voice back at them and you get confrontational, well, guess what? You've lost all leverage in that situation. Calm, you listen, you kind of follow the playbook on this. They don't have anywhere to go because the more amped up they get, the more they're just making a fool out of themselves. The more that they're saying, you know what, this person is unhinged. They don't get it. They don't understand this is summer league. Okay. If you're again the calm one and you sit there and, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, take a little bit of, you know, a little bit of heat. If, if you're the calm one in that and you don't escalate that situation, they've got nowhere to go. It shuts them down in a hurry. Again, keep that in mind. It, it's tough to do sometimes, but like I said, more importantly, like Evan said, if this happens and it happens, you know, repeatedly, I want to hear about it. I want to know about it because that coach and I are going to have a conversation. That team rep and I are going to have a conversation. More often than not, you're going to probably get an apology, you know, either in writing or in person. Because again, I will always have your back in the situation. But it makes my job a whole lot easier if you guys, again, don't escalate the situation. If you're the calm one, hey, it makes it real easy. So back to you, Evan. Totally spot on. We mentioned about substitution infractions earlier. That's a rarity. This one happens more than the substitution infractions. So it might be your meet, but just prepare yourself. The calmer you are, the better the outcome will be. At the end of the meet, tell coaches good meet gives you the opportunity if they have any questions for you about disqualifications. And to Frankie's point there, they might have cooled off from when they got amped up at event 30 and they may say, my bad, I'm sorry about that. I was a little excited or I had that crazy parent I need to, to pacify by come talk to you. Check in with the team rep, reps to get paid. You get paid at the meet. You get paid by both teams. Another good reason to read the rule book, you'll know how you're getting paid and by who. 
understand if you should get paid overtime. Overtime starts after three and a half hours. So six o'clock meets 9.30, 5.30 at nine o'clock. Understand how that, that works. If you don't understand how overtime pay works, don't be surprised if somebody doesn't pay you that. If you have a rain out, it can be 535. If you ran two events and you showed up, you are paid for a full day swim meet. It's basically $100 for showing up to the swim meet. The only exception to that is if rain is in the forecast at 8 a.m. and there's a hurricane coming in that afternoon and they get a hold of you and say, hey, we canceled our meet because it just looks horrendous. If you didn't leave your house, okay, you just got a free night to yourself. But if you show up, you get that flat fee just for showing up. Tips. Don't assume. We have found that uh, more and more teams will tip you. If you did a good job, it's okay for them to pad your pocket a little bit. Say thanks. It's not okay for them to pad your pocket before the meet starts. But don't expect that you get a tip. If you get one, great. That's a bit of a bonus. If not, that's okay too. We hope that $100 for three and a half hours is pretty good uh, side money. If you have any issues out of the ordinary at the meet, if it's significant, call Frankie on your way home. If it's really significant, this would be an extreme rarity. It's okay for you to stop the meet for a second during an exhibition heat, pick up your phone and say, I need to call Frankie right now. You guys, typically how Frankie and I work uh, the meets is that he is staying at the computer to answer technical questions and I'm usually driving around. It's happened before they say, hey, can you stop what you're doing and go drive to this meet? Okay. Every now and then police have to get called if something flares up. We hope those don't happen. But again, having Frankie's phone number in your phone is a great way to ensure that, that situation will never happen because you're prepared for it. If it's insignificant, you just want to make Frankie aware, hey, I had a minor issue or, hey, this team didn't really seem like they knew rules at all. Send them an email. Send them an email that night or first thing in the morning. Again, if you have any feedback that you want to get, we'd love to get that from you before we hear about it from the teams the next day. Because if they're emotionally charged, they're going to let us know. Compensation. We said 100 bucks split between the two teams, 50 per. Any meet that lasts longer than three and a half hours will be paid $10 per team for each 20 minutes or increments that last past three and a half hours. The only exception to this, guys, is if you have a rain out that you come back to, so we said that situation earlier where rained out, you come back on a Saturday morning, the home team will pay your full freight again because they've got concession stand money. So you get another $100 if you come back to a rain out reschedule. Okay, make sure you familiarize yourself with this. Crazy folks, if you have a crazy swimmer, swimmers don't give enough space to walk the deck, you can't do your job. First, have a conversation with those kids. Hey, kids, slide back, get your feet out of the water. If they don't listen, ask the coach for help with their kids. A lot of pools will rope off that area for you, but not all have ropes, not all have big pool decks. If swimmers keep pestering you for information or berates you, initially ask the coach for help. Second, ask the head coach. Third, ask the team rep to go find that kid or find that kid's parents but don't deal with that swimmer's parents. That's gonna set you up to a, my child is a perfect angel. You must've been doing something for that person. A coach or a parent rep knows the job that you're trying to do. Not every individual parent on that team understands the role of what you're trying to do. If you have a crazy parent, be respectful of your engagement with that energetic parent. I think we've covered this. The more you talk calmly, the more they look foolish. If the parent doesn't disengage quickly, look for the head coach or the parent rep to intervene and get that parent off the pool deck. There are some pools where uh, libations are acceptable. Sometimes that helps get things excited when it really shouldn't be. Be aware that, that as the meat progresses, sometimes that is a contributing factor. Okay, finally, what if you have a crazy hot person? Forget about that person, you have a job to do. Get a phone number after the meet, okay? We try to have a little bit of light, a little sense of humor in this presentation as well. Remember what your job is. If you see somebody, 
don't be flirting. If you know that other team's coach, you know them after the meet. Same rules apply. Final reminders, don't be late. We said at the beginning of this, have the home team's rep cell phone number in your car just in case something comes up. Have Frankie's phone number in your phone in case something catastrophic comes up where you need to give him a note. Unfortunately, I just got in a car accident. There's no way I'm going to make the meet. Frankie can then call them or maybe he sends me over there to help fill in the back half of the meet as soon as I can get there. Great example. That's proactive professionalism. Communicate with the home team at least 24 hours in advance of the meet. Meet with key people before the meet to, they, to make sure that they know what their roles are. If you're running late, again, let the home team know. If your schedule changes, again, as a reminder, we'll be sending out the schedule for the summer here in the next 24 hours. Check that in advance to make sure that you know and you can confirm the meet dates that you can work. If something comes up and there is an emergency and you know that three days in advance, call Frankie, call me and say something tragic came up. I can't make it Thursday. It gives us a little bit of time to try to call some people on that on-call list. There's not much we can do at 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon to pick up the phone on that on-call list and see if we can backfill a meet. Okay, That's on you to help us help the teams. Give us 24, 48 hours ahead of time. We'll probably pretty sure we can backfill that meet. Be impartial. You might not have friends. Act like you don't know them. Be professional. Don't be memorable for the wrong reasons. And remember, at the end of the day, it's about fun. And if you stay calm, you can also tell that coach or that parent or that crazy person, this is summer league. It's supposed to be fun. And you're not making it fun. All right, one more time. The rule book. Go to the Swimtopia webpage and see the rules. All right. We'll stop here for a second. Ask questions if you want them. Uh, if you have not already done so, please go ahead and put your name in the chat line so we have uh, a record of attendance. And then if you'd like to, you can come off of mute and ask any questions that you might also still have.